For me, the word longevity is not about how long you live. It's also not about how well you live into your old age. It's about how you live today and right now and what habits you currently have. But before I elaborate, I want to make sure that you subscribe to our page, hit the notification bell, make sure you're made aware of when our new videos are being dropped. My name is Dr. Stephen Janopoulos, affectionately known in social media as Dr. Stephen G. We're looking at markers that reflect biological age, not just chronological age. Those biomarkers don't have to necessarily be rooted in high technology as much as they have to be rooted in tried and true research. They have to have been studied and hopefully over decades. So I have three criteria in which to include biomarkers that are valuable in determining your biological age. The first criteria is does that marker reflect an organ or bodily system and how it functions? So for example, what does not qualify as that that is important for your health is things like vitamin D or even blood sugar, right? So blood sugar, vitamin D, these are things that can be altered and changed pretty dramatically through lifestyle change, which can be very good for you, but it doesn't tell us about how we can predict your longevity or your long-term health because I can take someone who's a type 2 diabetic and in just 8 to 12 weeks reverse that as long as they make the lifestyle changes that I ask them to. However, that does not tell me about what's going to happen with them for the rest of their lives and the decisions that they're going to make. Another example of this would be something that has been very much utilized as a longevity marker that I don't think is very valuable called telomere length. Telomere length is the length of the ends of your chromosomes and that's been associated with longevity in that if the telomere length remains long into your older years, then you're, it's predictive of you having longevity. However, the research does not bear. Telomere length has a lot more to do with just overall genetics and is not necessarily associated with longevity, at least from a causal perspective. Okay, so the second criteria marker would have to meet is that the marker should show a correlation with age across different populations. And the third most important criteria is the marker something that can change and can improve with ongoing lifestyle change or interventions. A great example of one of the biomarkers that fits all three of these criteria is grip strength. You see, grip strength for 50 years has been associated with greater outcomes across every single spectrum of measuring health. So it's been a longevity marker. It's reflected in all-cause mortality. It's more predictive of heart disease or stroke or heart attack than your systolic blood pressure, which is mind-boggling to me. It's also predictive of cancer. It's predictive of diabetes. It's predictive of poor nutrition, bone mineral density. So many of your risk factors for falling and fracture are associated with grip strength. And grip strength can be measured very simply with a hand dynamometer. It should be done on the same machine in the same way, probably at the same time of day whenever you're checking it. And it's something that you should track and improve. Now, the question is, is it grip strength itself that's the issue or is it what gives you your grip strength so this is where the longevity markers or these valuable markers are things that really can't be fooled in the short term right so if you wanted to improve your longevity could you quickly just in two or three weeks improve your grip strength not really your grip strength is reflective of who you've been for a long period of time your grip strength is reflective of the activity that you have over, let's just say, the years leading up to testing it. So if you're 55 plus years old and you're in the top five percentile of your age group, well, that tells me about who you have been nutritionally, actively, and of course, genetically. But it's not something that you can fake because in order for your hand to be strong, your arm needs to be strong, your spine needs to be strong. Think about it. In order for me to pick up a heavy object, I have to have two things working for me. The muscles needed to lift the object, so the hand grip and let's just say the bicep, but I also have to have stability, right? So I'm going to bend down and lift something up. I need to have stability on the opposite side. So I'm going to use my left hand to pick up a heavy object, say a kettlebell. I have to have spinal stability. If I don't have spinal stability, it doesn't matter how strong my hand is or how strong my arm is, I'm not going to be able to lift it. I'm going to injure myself. So you could see that grip strength, it's not just about the grip strength. Do I want to do things that improve my grip strength? Well, the research does show by just improving your grip strength, you actually do improve all these markers. But I would rather you see you doing whole body activity 
that will also manifest as improved grip strength. So let's just say if you're doing a farmer's carry, like what is a farmer's carry? It's where you carry heavy objects and you walk around with them, right? As if you were building a house or doing some kind of project, gardening project outside. A farmer's carry is just kind of, I don't really have anything to build outside. I don't have any gardening to do, but I'm going to benefit from that activity by carrying heavy weights in my arms at my side and I'm going to go for a walk. And this is something that has been shown to improve all kinds of cardiovascular markers as well as prevent the loss of muscle as you age and the list goes on on and on. Another thing you can do is what's called a dead hang. A dead hang is where you just hang from a pull-up or a chin-up bar and measure how long you can hold yourself there, right? So I remember when I first started doing this, I couldn't believe it. Between 30 and 40 seconds was a struggle and then getting that up to a minute and a half in, you know, it took several months to get to that point, but that's something that I now maintain, right? Because it's a measure of my overall function. And looking at a farmer's carry, I always want to know that I have good spinal stability as well, because again, as you get older, your primary objective is to not get hurt so that you can continue to be physically active. The older you get, the more time it takes to heal. And, you know, most difficult injuries and unpredictable injuries is your spinal injuries, right? Anything that could affect your neck or your lower back as far as your discs and your nerves. These are things that we really have a difficult time with once those injuries occur. As the weeks go on, I'm going to go into all of the markers that I think are important for that meet these criteria and that are important for you to track. So if I were to say, what are the five categories that I think are most important. I think we need to look at our blood chemistry and that's something that I like to do repeatedly multiple times a year. I'm not saying you have to do that, but it's something that I like to track because it tells me about my nutritional lifestyle. It tells me about my sleep quality. It tells me a lot about my hormones and it allows me to track things that are changing in the short term based on lifestyle changes I'm always making anyway. I'm always trying different things. I'll go on a carnivore diet for a while. I'll go on even a vegan diet for a while. I haven't done that in many years, but I've done it and I like to try different things and I like to use my blood chemistry as a way to monitor the effect of those things. So one of the ways that I think you can track your health is by having a comprehensive wellness assessment. The next one is going to be well, strength, strength measurements, right? So we're talking about grip strength here. You can use a hand dynamometer to measure your grip strength. You can look at how long you can hang from a chin-up bar as a measure of your overall grip strength. You can look at farmer's carry. You can also look at your ability to do five repetitions of a push exercise, a pull exercise, and a hip hinge exercise. So five rep max, well, you know, one rep max would probably be best, but that's a great way to hurt yourself. Five rep max, I think is good because you can say, what weight can I lift safely by myself five repetitions? So that could be a bench press for the push. It could be a row for the pull, and it could be a deadlift for the hip hinge. And knowing what your five rep max is and seeing that improve is a great marker to track. The next one would be VO2 max. VO2 max and resting metabolic rate, how your body utilizes energy. The value is just remarkable. And the target should be in the elite status of your decade, right? So there are some people who like to be in the top 25% of the decade behind them, right? So if you're 55 years old and the average VO2 max is 35, well, then you want to be at the top 10%. You don't want to be at the average. You want to be at the top 10% of the decade behind Behind you. That would be a good goal to shoot for to improve your VO2 max and your resting metabolic rate, right? The ability for you to burn energy just sitting there at your desk or not doing much activity tells us about your ability to maintain lean body mass, which is much more metabolically active. So the higher your resting metabolic rate is, the better right? It means that you're not going to store fat and you're not going to find yourself losing muscle at a particular rate. All right. Then after that, we have your flexibility, right? We want to know that your joints have full range of motion, your hips, your spine, your knees, 
your shoulders, because range of motion tells us a lot about, well, the degenerative changes that people experience in their skeleton, observable on x-ray, MRI, and CT scan. But more importantly, the range of motion of your joints tells us about muscle integrity, as well as connective tissue, right? So there are proteins like collagen and elastin that if we're experiencing a loss of bodily proteins, we experience a loss of muscle, a loss of collagen, a loss of elastin, those could be replaced by less flexible tissue, and that can really be a problem as we get older. So your range of motion is also determined by the stability of your joints and the integrity of your nervous system control over those joints. Remember, if you're unstable, your body will limit your range of motion so that you do not injure yourself. But this becomes a a kind of a vicious cycle. So I believe that Again, these criteria are met by looking at ranges of motion and something that you could easily track. And then finally, looking at your body composition, actually measuring lean muscle mass that's more metabolically active. How much muscle do you have compared to subcutaneous fat and then compared to visceral fat, right? We should be targeting our visceral fat to be zero and we should have a good ratio of lean muscle mass to body fat because body fat, as you get older, the tendency is for you to have less muscle and more fat and that does not allow for a metabolically healthy situation. So body composition. So there, are, those are five assessments that if you track them once, twice, three, or even four times a year, you could track them for improvement. You can track them to monitor that they don't go down, or you could track them if they do go down, right? So blood chemistry analysis, VO2 max and resting metabolic rate, strength, flexibility, and body composition. Those are the five things I think would give you the most information for the least amount of money as long as the interpretation is done properly and that you're given a plan of action to improve all five of them.